Father, I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. Christ, I pray.
one. Uh, we are going to start in a few minutes, so let me invite you guys to find your seats. And we'll get started really shortly. I'd like to welcome everyone here today as we come to worship our great God. It's so great to see all of you, especially those who are just visiting us for today for the first time. And uh, if it's your first time here, we want to welcome you. Hopefully some of our regulars will welcome you and make you feel at home. But we also want to welcome those on the live stream. Uh, uh, it's so great for you us to join. Great for you to join us today as well. So as we gather to, together to hear God's word to worship him, let me draw your attention to our bulletin, which you can find at gracepoint.org.au forward slash bulletin, forward slash go forward slash bulletin. And I'll repeat that, gracepoint.org.au forward slash go forward slash bulletin. And that will help you guys follow along with our service today. Each week we recognize the call to worship, God, through his word and spirit, invites us into his presence and calls us into his life and mission. So let us prepare our minds and our hearts to receive God's word to us today. Let me begin with a prayer with a portion from Psalm 9. Let's bow our heads and pray. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in thanksgiving and in, wor in worship, for you have done marvelous and wonderful deeds. You have redeemed us and saved us from the bondage of sin through, the, through your Son on the cross. So as we come together as your people, let us rejoice in your name and sing of your great deeds. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to invite the music team to lead us in worship. How about we stand as we sing to our holy God?
rises to rejoice. Behold, how God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold, how king, nothing can compare, come let us adore. Who is given? Please take a seat. Now we've come to a time of confession of sin. And in scripture, whenever people find themselves in God's presence, 
they see how far they have fallen short of his glory. If this is your first time here, what this means is that Christians recognize that they have disobeyed the God of this universe. And as Christians, we make a confession of our disobedience, both as a community and also silently as individuals. First, we're going to spend a few minutes confessing our sins to our God, and then we are going to read out the prayer of confession together. So let me invite you guys to all spend some time confessing your sins to God. Let me invite you guys to open up the prayer of confession in your bulletins, and we can read that all together with one voice. Let us pray the prayer of confession. Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you, and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there was no God, and we fall short of our incredible witnesses to you. For these things we ask for your forgiveness, and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open hearts, so we may witness to our world. Remind us to be who you are us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In this, we remember that God is always ready, uh, he, by his mercy and grace, to forgive us. The Bible promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins of all all unrighteousness. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And the right response is that we should be grateful and knowing full well that it is by the grace of God that he sent Christ to die for our sins. Psalm 106 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are sorry for our disobedience to you. We acknowledge and sincerely confess before you, most holy majesty, before you, most holy majesty, that we are miserable sinners, conceived and born in sin, prone to evil, incapable in the flesh of doing any good work. We thank you so much that you sent Jesus Christ to set us free from sin. And by your grace, we have been saved through faith, not that we can boast, but that we can magnify his glory. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Now we've come to a time of congregational prayer, and this is just an opportunity for us to pray with one voice. God invites us to pray and to cast all our burdens and anxieties onto Him, and that's because He cares. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Let me invite Justin up to pray for us. Hi everyone, I'm Justin, and I have the privilege of praying on behalf of our congregation this Sunday. This week, we will be asking God to help us emulate Christ-like love as we serve each other in speech and deed. Please join with me in prayer. (coughs) Dear Heavenly Father, praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, 
to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those who you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the further seas who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the waves, the roaring of the seas, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. For so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. All creation gives you praise. Lord, <coughs> despite your sovereignty and love, we too often live life by sight rather than by faith. We pursue the transient things that we see, hoping that they would satisfy our innate desire for value, comfort, and joy. <coughs> but we are disappointed again and again, for our soul gains no pleasure from them. We work hard to be successful and wealthy, neglecting our spiritual lives because they seem inconvenient, not realizing that foolish men before us have followed the same path, only to be left more empty and lifeless than before. We enjoy the created things that you give us, letting them govern our lives as though they are gods, not knowing that these are given and taken away by the same hand, the hand of the creator and the one true God. We are sorry, Lord, for the idols that we grip so tightly onto and sometimes refuse to deny, even though in Christ we have our greatest need met and through Christ all our other needs are also wonderfully provided for. Forgive us, Father, as your Son intercedes for us. For Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been slain, his blood painted on the door frames of our souls, protecting us from your rightful wrath on sinners. We thank you, Lord, for Christ, whose sacrifice is the manifestation of your perfect love. Thank you that we can know what love is and are able to love others because you have shown us what true love is. We also thank you that although you are primarily concerned for our spiritual well-being, you do not ignore our physical needs. We thank you for our meals that we have every day and the means to be able to afford them. We thank you for those in the health industry who help mitigate the bodily suffering we might endure. We also thank you for the strength that you provide so that we are able to serve others whilst bearing the thorns of our own bodies. Thank you that suffering is not meaningless, but instead grows our faith in steadfastness. Truly, we are a people blessed by your providence. Finally, we pray and ask that you continue to shape us in the image of Christ, that we at Grace Point can grow in our love for others, in our speech and service towards them. May we imitate Christ, who did not save us or not save us because of our ethnicity, social status, strength or lack thereof, physical and emotional scars and other characteristics that might separate someone from human love. But Christ saved us simply because he loved us deeply. And by that we know that nothing separates us from your love. So then, let not such things separate our fellow brothers and sisters from our love. For whenever we serve the least of them, we serve Christ. Help us also love each other through, our, through what we say, either by speech, which builds up one another, or by silence, when we might harm others with our rash words. <clears throat> May we learn to bridle our tongues so that we might not slander your name and the teaching of Christ by which we live. We pray and ask all this in your son's most precious name. Amen. Now it's time for our weekly catechism. Catechism means uh, biblical and theological truths taught in the form of questions and answers. 
And recently, we've been going through question three of the New City Catechism, which asks, how many persons are there in God? And the answer, there are three persons in the one and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. And in this question, we are affirming that God is a trinity, that he is three persons, one God. And what we are not affirming is that there are three gods or that there, are, there is one God that sometimes acts in three ways and he shows three different masks at different times. He's saying that, it's saying that one, there is one God revealed to us in the scriptures which, who is perfectly willed, who is uh, perfectly willed in essence and intention. But in this one God, there is three persons that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everything that God does, He does together as the Trinity. And what this means is that the Trinity cooperates together in doing whatever God does. Why does this matter? This, matter beca this matters because if we are to understand what God does, we must understand Him acting together as one in the Trinity though nobody can fully comprehend the Trinity because God is beyond our comprehension. But God has so graciously revealed himself through his word. And understanding how each person of God relates to each other gives us a vivid picture of the true unity with diversity, the true eternal unfailing love in the Trinity and how they relate to each other, and the role that each person plays in the Trinity for our salvation. So church, I'll read out the question and let's all respond with one voice. How many persons are there in God? There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the Son in substance, equal in power and glory. Now it's a time for announcements. And the first announcement is that we are having our annual congregational meeting right after the service. So there'll be a short break, but then right after, I think about 11.30, we'll, 11.15, we'll have our ACM here. This is for the members and regulars at Grace Point. But if you're just visiting, you're welcome to attend and just sit back and observe. Uh, you'll hear about the updates of all the ministries that, that are happening at Grace Point. Uh, the budget, and all that good stuff. So feel free to join us. The second announcement is the outreach event that is happening at Wentworth Field and Harris Park. Pastor Dinesh is out there on Saturdays every week, and he would love to see you guys there. This is an opportunity for you guys to do evangelism uh, in that area. And if you would like more information, please uh, let me know or contact one of the pastors. Lastly, we have moved... Uh, completely online for offering. And we want to be encouraging you to continually be giving generously, to partner with Grace Point and to see our city and our world to know the good news of Jesus. So if you're a regular at Grace Point, we want to be encouraging you to give generously. And you can find all that information in the bulletin. Just scroll down uh, and you can find the bank account for Lidcom AM. Now we've come to a time of Bible reading. Uh, I'm going to invite Tash, and the passage comes up, comes from chapter 12 of Acts. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tash, and I'll be reading today's passage from Acts 12. Hear God's word. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, 
he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord had sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the, ent at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to, the an came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the, anoint on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be able to open the Bible with you guys. Haven't uh, seen some of you for a while. Um, as we come this Lord's Day to God's Word, let me invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. Uh, we are looking at this portion of the Scriptures, and as we do that, let me actually pray for us. Father, I do thank you that you speak and you reveal yourself in and through your Word. We do pray and ask that this Lord's Day we might draw strength uh, and encouragement as we look at this portion of the Bible uh, that is here to encourage us to be bold in making the Lord Jesus known. And so we pray and ask this in his name. Amen. It's uh, fair to say that in the West right now, we're now living in a culture that doesn't look too kindly on your Christian faith. In fact, we live in a culture that's increasingly and openly hostile to the followers of Jesus. To those of you who hold uh, a Christian worldview, uh, in a 2018 report, the Observatory on Intolerance and Discrimination Against Christians warns of increasing ways Christians are being squeezed. And this is like four or five years ago, and we certainly feel it today. This is what the report says. Negative stereotyping in the media, legal action against Christian-owned businesses under so-called equality laws, and Christian parents being hindered in raising their children according to their faith. This is four years ago. Across Europe, Christians have been fired, sued, and even arrested for exercising their freedom of expression and conscience. Christian-run businesses have been financially ruined. Christian student groups have been silenced. And Christian symbols and celebrations have been removed from the public square. Now, that has only intensified the last four years. We know that to be true. Uh, in every sphere of life, from our schools to our universities to our workplace, even in the political arena, there is now an open and very acceptable hostility, social hostility, to the Christian faith and to followers of Jesus. In fact, the more opposed you are to the Christian worldview, the more progressive you appear, the greater your acceptance in society and culture today. Uh, you also might not be aware, but in 2016, Australia was ranked as one of 13 nations to have experienced an increase in government restrictions and social hostility when it comes to religion. 
alongside Iraq, Syria, Pakistan, Yemen, Lebanon, Malaysia, Jordan, Ukraine, Burundi, Mongolia, and those three other Western nations, the US, the UK, and Canada. So it's really no surprise, four years on, uh, we find ourselves living in a culture, living in an age where there is open and very acceptable social hostility to the Christian faith and those who call themselves followers of Jesus. Some of you have experienced that personally in the workplace. Some of you are experiencing it right now in your course of study. Some of you are dealing with it in your children's schools. And some of you are worried about what the future looks like for your children. And so this is why we need the book of Acts. This is why we've been studying the book of Acts, uh, not just the last few months, but at the start of last year. The book of Acts isn't just an account of how the early church grew, okay? How the good news of Jesus is saving what goes out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. The book of Acts isn't just an account of the cultural challenges the early church faced, crossing cultural and ethnic barriers to include all sorts of people that the early church would not normally have included or associated with. Uh, the, the salvation, the inclusion of the half-breed Jews, the Samaritans, uh, the salvation of the black sexually altered man, the Ethiopian eunuch, that's Acts 8. Uh, the salvation of the violent religious extremist, that's Saul, the Pharisee, in Acts 9. Uh, the salvation of the rank military officer, Cornelius, in Acts 10. As the good news of Jesus goes out, it's crossing cultural and ethnic barriers. It's including all sorts of people. But the book of Acts also gives us an account of the hostility the early church faced and how the early church responded to it. The persecution the early church faced and how the church actually responded to it. There are lessons there for us as the people of God. Now, we know in the historical narrative of the book of Acts, as the book of Acts unfolds in its historical na narrative, um, there's an overnight, uh, an overnight imprisonment and threats made in Acts 4, right? They can deal with that. And then you've got Stephen stoning in Acts 7, Right? It's there. But if you have your Bible, look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 2, because this is when the systematic persecution of actually begins. So you've got sporadic and then now systematic. Acts 8, verse 1 and 2. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles who scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, mourned deeply for him. And in verse 3, but Saul. See that? But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. As the text unfolds, as the historical narrative of Acts unfolds, you discover Saul now hunts them down. Okay? Now, this is a constant refrain in the book of Acts, right? A constant pattern in the book of Acts. And, and you've got to write this down. Where there is persecution, there is always proclamation. Where there is persecution, the good news of Jesus is proclaimed. That's going to be a pattern in the book of Acts. Wherever there, whenever there's persecution, Jesus is proclaimed. A reminder to us that nothing will stop the proclamation of the good news of Jesus. It will be proclaimed, irrespective of persecution. Now, we come to chapter 12. And in, Acts, in chapter 12, what happens is uh, Luke, the author of Acts, brings us back to Jerusalem, the center of persecution. So we're back in Jerusalem, and the rising tide of hostility has intensified against the church and the people of God. And what we're going to see is what God's people do and what God does. Okay? What God's people do and what God does. And the way the narrative uh, unpacks itself or unfolds is very, very important. It's there in your sermon outlines. Uh, you can look at that in your bulletin or go to gracepoint slash go slash uh, sermon, a sermon uh, or sermon outline. I think that's it. Uh, and you'll find it there. Uh, but there are several headings that unpack for us the text. You've got a king who rages against God's people. You've got a church who prays for rescue. You've got a rescue in response to prayer. You've got a king who's struck down. And the way Acts 12 ends is God's word continues being proclaimed. You see there? Now, notice how this passage starts and ends. The passage opens King Herod executing James, one of the leaders of the church. And the passage actually ends, notice, with King Herod struck down. So it begins with a persecutor persecuting, and it ends with a persecutor struck down, and the good news of Jesus being proclaimed. And so this is the lesson, and I'm going to give it to you up front, just in case you miss everything else in the middle of the sermon. Okay, I'm going to give it to you up front. This is the main, this is the takeaway. Uh, it is folly and foolish and futile to oppose Jesus. 
if you fight Jesus, you might win now, but you will lose at the end. Okay? Nothing will stop the good news of Jesus being made known. Okay? This is what we're meant to see in Acts chapter 12. You might live in a culture that is hostile to the Christian faith. You might be in an environment where you feel small and insignificant because you're the only Christian there in the workplace or maybe in your course of study. Uh, you might be in a place where Christian leaders have been removed by political authority. That's not happening here, but it's happening in many parts of East Asia. But here is the lesson from Acts 12. It is folly to oppose Jesus. If you fight Jesus, you will lose. It might look like you win now, but you will ultimately lose. Nothing will stop the good news of Jesus from being made known. Okay, so that's the serpent in a nutshell. You can all leave now. No, let's have a look at the text. Have a look at verse 1 and verse 4 with me. Look at how Acts chapter 12 actually begins. Darkness descends on the Jerusalem church with the arrest of those who belong to the church. We read King Herod initiates this with the intention of persecuting them. He imprisons them to persecute them. Verse 1, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Um, he physically laid hands on them. That's the idea there, right? He arrested them, intending to persecute them. Now, what does this persecution mean? Well, what does it mean? Look at verse 2. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. It's death by the sword. Public execution for those who call themselves disciples of Jesus. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. And so uh, this is the change. Previously, you had persecution by the Jewish authorities, you come to Acts chapter 12, and now you have persecution by political authority, okay? By those who hold power in political authority. And it's persecution or execution now by the sword. Now, what's the intention of persecution? In the narrative of Acts, the intention of persecution is to silence the Christian voice. It is to stop the proclamation of the gospel, Okay, that is the intention of persecution. It is always to stop and silence the Christian voice, to stop the spread of the good news of Jesus. Uh, Barney Swartz, Barney Swartz was the ex-religion editor for The Age, one of our Aussie newspapers. He's now a senior fellow with the Center for Public Christianity. And in a speech titled, The Challenge of Secularism, he writes of the current climate we are experiencing across our nation. And so he's actually a journalist. This is what he writes. <clears throat> Six years ago, I covered the second global atheist convention in Melbourne for The Age, for the newspaper. An American lady from Freedom From Religion Foundation told how her organization had stopped an Alabama college football team praying before the games. As far as she knew, they were all willing participants, all believers, but she wasn't going to allow God near a state school competition. She told the story triumphantly. She expected applause, and applause she got. And I got an insight into the militant secularist mind, which is a fundamentalist, which is as fundamentalist as any religious version. What all fundamentalism have in common, whether religious or secular, atheist or totalitarian, is the assumption that there is only one way to live, and they will tell us how we should live that life. And then he writes in his, in his speech, such stories are increasingly common, and some of you will remember this. At the absurd end was the Queensland Education Department dictum that primary school students must not be allowed to talk about Jesus in the playground. That was a couple of years back. This is a more extreme version of the attempt to ban Christmas and Easter from schools and public spaces, usually on the spurious grounds that people of other faiths feel excluded. And then he writes, in my 12 years as religion editor, I have never found one Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu who felt excluded. They were happy for Christian holidays to be observed and hoped that their own might be noticed as well. No, the move comes from secular ideology. Now, let me say this. This, this hostility, this attempt to silence the Christian voice isn't a new thing. Read Acts 12. You have attempts to silence the Christian voice from those in political authority, you have a king who rages against God's people. Now, who is King Herod? Well, he was the king the Roman emperor appointed, put in charge of the region of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Okay? Now, his name is important. Uh, he was the grandson of Herod the Great who ordered the slaughter of boys two years under uh, in the time of Jesus, at the birth of Jesus. He was friends of the two emperors that came. Uh, Caligula and Claudius, 
and he was a real politician. That's what the historians tell us. Josephus tells us that. Uh, he was Jewish by race, but not by religious convictions, which means that when he was with the Jews, he adopted Jewish practices. He would go through the rituals. But when he was with the Romans, he acted like a Roman. He lived like a Roman. Okay? And so here is someone who did anything to maintain political influence, to maintain political party. And so you can imagine why he opposed Jewish Christians, because they're a threat to his kingship, his rule. Right? They, they threaten political instability because they are causing division among the Jews, or so he thought. So notice verse 2. What does he do? He goes for the jugular. Go for the head, and hopefully the body will die. Okay? Take out the leader, and then the group will disperse. Okay? He starts with the execution of one of the 12 apostles, James, the brother of John. He arrested some, but he executes James. Now, we know that he does this for political reasons. Look at verse 3. He does it, notice, to win the favor of the Jews to win the support of his Jewish citizens, as it were. For, so verse 3, when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. And so what you begin to discover is that he's more interested in increasing his political base than he is in the truth. Uh, he's more interested in increasing his popularity than he is in the truth, which is why, which is why he sees... Uh, that the Jews' approval of this execution, right, then motivates him to also now seize Peter as well. Another apostle is seized as another is being executed. Now, it is a political move, really, to gain votes. Uh, because you read, when he saw that this man with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also, another one of the apostles. Not just any apostle, but this time, the leader of the Jerusalem church. Now, notice what happens in verse 4. Peter is arrested and he's put in prison. He's handed over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Okay? Uh, verse 4, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So it's, it's like a religious holiday season. So he's been put in prison. After prison, there's going to be a public trial. No, no, no. It's not a trial, really. We all know it's going to be a public execution. Because when you look at verse 6, you notice how securely Peter is in prison. Because he's the icing on the cake for Herod. Uh, he's executed James, one of the leaders of the church, but now he's got the leader of the Jerusalem church, the apostle who founded the church. Okay? And so we read, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between the two guards, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Uh, you know, it's like, it's, it, it's, the narrative tells us that there is such security around Peter because he's like really the ice, he's the star prisoner for Herod, as it were. Okay, and the way it worked is four squads of four, and every three hours they would rotate guards, right, to make sure they would be awake. Uh, two were chained to him, one on his left and one on his right. The other two stood at the cell door, and they rotated every three hours. Now, we know it's not going to be a public trial. It's going to be another public execution. So verse 1 to verse 4 ends in darkness. The church is under siege. Leaders taken overwhelmed and helpless. James is being executed. Peter is, is in prison, headed for the same fate. God's people are powerless and helpless. And you know, when you read verse 1 to verse 4, we didn't read beyond verse 5. We realize, or we sort of think, well, it looks like evil has triumphed. And this is taking place during the festival of the unleavened bread, Passover week. The very same week Jesus was seized, the same week Jesus was beaten, the same week Jesus was unjustly murdered, and it's grim, isn't it? Because it looks like the start of the end of the church. Okay, look at verse 5. What does the powerless, helpless, overwhelmed church do? While Peter is kept in prison, notice what, the, what does the church do? The church earnestly prayed to God for him. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. Now, I do want you to notice the contrast between verse 1 and verse 4 and verse 5, okay? So you've got verse 1 and verse 5, and in verse 5, on one side you have a king who is wielding a sword, threatening the people of God. On the other side you have the powerless people of God praying. See that? On the one side, secular, godless, power-hungry king raging against the church with a sword. On the other side you have a church deep, in earnest prayer, the word is agonizing prayer, straining in prayer, looking up to God. 
On the one side, Herod fighting the church with a sword. On the other side, the church fighting the world with prayer. Isn't that amazing? Notice how God's people respond to hostility, to persecution, to those who want to silence their voice. Notice God's people don't start a political campaign, do they? Notice God's people don't start a political lobby group. They don't take up physical arms. They don't threaten violence in response to violence. They don't cave in and succumb to the pressure of persecution. They don't fall into despair and hopelessness because culture is hostile to their faith. The church's response to persecution and hostility is prayer. Write that down. The church's response to persecution and hostility is prayer. They give themselves to earnestly praying to God. They look upward to God, straining in prayer, agonizing in prayer. Now, here is a lesson for us, isn't it? Because this is actually a pattern in the book of Acts. Whenever you find the church facing hostility, you find the people of God praying. Hear that. Whenever you find the people of God facing hostility, you find the people of God praying. The world looks at Christian prayer and they think, that's weakness, that's hopeless. But no, that is where the Christian looks for strength. Not within, not to arms, but to higher authority. Remind yourself of that truth. We look for strength, not within, not to arms, but always to higher authority. To the one who holds the destiny of kings and queens in their hands. You know, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to verse 21, uh, as Daniel faced hostility, the threat of death under, under a different political authority, Babylonian power and political authority, this is what he prayed. He prayed, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He deposes kings and he raises up others. He changes times and seasons. And that is exactly what God does in the book of Daniel as the people of God face political power threatening them. He deposes and raises up others. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius. And in chapter 12, you'll see at the end, he deposes Herod. And so whenever you find, wherever you find the people of God facing hostility, you find the people of God praying. To the one who has rescued us from the ultimate enemy, death itself. Because it stands to reason, if he's rescued us from death, surely he's able to rescue us from anything else we face in life. Which is why in Acts chapter 4, right? Acts, uh, Acts 2, sorry, in Acts chapter 2, right at the start in Acts 2, verse 23 and 24, Peter actually testifies to God's absolute power and authority even over the death of Jesus. Because if Jesus has conquered death, surely he can rescue us from anything else. We read verse 23 of Acts 2. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Yes, he died. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In the face of a culture that is uh, becoming deeply secularized and hostile to your faith, as many of you, I know, try to survive in a workplace that will disadvantage you for not supporting their secular, secular values. As you navigate schools that will force their progressive morality on your children. As you engage, as many of you here are, in higher education, university, tertiary studies, that's increasingly shaped by ideology rather than education. As you face laws that will make it hard for you to live out and express your Christian faith, if there's one thing we can learn from the early church, it's this. It's to agonize and strain in prayer for deliverance. It's to agonize and strain in prayer for deliverance. Which is why we pray, you know, every second week we pray the Lord's Prayer here at Grace Point. Right? In our Sunday worship. Why do we do it? Okay? It's a reminder to us that we have a God who is in heaven powerfully ruling over the circumstances of our lives and our world. We have a God who is our Father in heaven, committed to us, His children. That's what it means to pray, our Father in heaven. It's the reason why we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
keep us from the temptation of being afraid. Keep us from the temptation of giving up. Deliver us from the wicked, the oppressor, the hostile, the evil that seeks to derail us. Whenever you find the people of God facing hostility, whenever you find attempts to silence the people of God, you should find the people of God praying. True for them, true for us. Now, have a look at what happens next. Verse 6 to verse 17 is rather long, but this is what's happening. What follows next is a rescue. A rescue in response to prayer. We read suddenly, verse 7, something supernatural takes place, something out of this world takes place, the impossible takes place. Why? Because uh, as you look at this portion of the Bible, verse 16 and verse 17, Peter moves from deepest darkness to an open street. Uh, Peter finds himself no longer in in chains, but free. Even Peter is unsure what's happening. Look at verse 7. This angelic being strikes him to wake him up. There's a blinding light, and then he thinks he's having a vision. Verse 7, verse 9, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really, what, what the angel was doing was really happening. He's not sure if this is real. He thought he was seeing a vision. Now, notice how Luke, uh, the writer, stre- stresses how tight the security is around Peter. King Herod will not be denied his prize execution. Look at verse 6. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two guards bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Uh, The reason why the Bible, uh, uh, why Luke the author does it this way is to make it clear that this is an impossible rescue. He's well guarded. But darkness will not be the last word. The light of God's grace strikes powerfully. Verse 7, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. You, you know, and when you read this portion of the scriptures, you begin to realize that Peter cannot uh, escape, as it were. He cannot work his way out of prison. He cannot pay or bribe his way out. He cannot overcome uh, his captors by his own power and strength. And it's there to emphasize that God acts to save Peter. And if you look at this passage very carefully, you know, you sort of realize that this is a picture of grace at work. God is saving. God is actually coming to Peter. God is releasing his chains. God opens the door. Because in this rescue, Peter does nothing. In fact, Peter's obedience, his ability to act, is made possible because the chains first fell off. That's what we read, verse 7 to verse 10. One writer makes this observation about this portion of the Bible. Everything turns on God's gracious initiative exercised through an angel. Peter is fast asleep and contributes nothing more than his sheer incomprehension and unbelief. Now, if you are a regular grace one, you would have heard me say this. And let me say this to you. This is what makes, as you look at this portion of the Bible, this is what makes the Christian faith different, Christian faith different from every other religious or secular worldview. Okay? This is what makes Christianity different. From, the, from every other religious or secular worldview. You notice that in religion, we must take the initiative to save ourselves. Rescue comes from keeping the law, doing good, living up to some moral standard. Redemption, redemption comes from making up for your past. So religion always says, look within. That's what religion does. Look within yourself and do better. Rescue comes from within. This is what you must do. Now, secularism works exactly the same way. In Western secularism, we must also take the initiative from within to save ourselves. Rescue comes from being strong enough, uh, being emotionally resilient. Rescue comes from being physically or intellectually better. Salvation comes from working harder to achieve economically or materially. Deliverance comes from looking within, living out your authentic self. Again, rescue comes from within, what you must do. And so there's very little difference between religious people and secular people. Uh, Both groups are looking for rescue, for salvation, for redemption from something in life. And they are looking for it within themselves. Now, let me actually tell you the problem if you've never realized this. If you are looking for acceptance and validation, if acceptance and validation is your salvation in life, looking for for acceptance and looking for validation doesn't actually 
work if you're looking within. Uh, you can tell yourself that you're acceptable. You can tell yourself that you're valued. But that actually doesn't make you acceptable. Doesn't it doesn't actually make you valued. It requires someone external to yourself, someone greater than you, who gives it to you, who says to you, you are loved, you are accepted, you are valued. Telling yourself you are valued doesn't do anything. If forgiveness is your salvation, maybe you're a religious type of person. If forgiveness is your salvation, looking within for forgiveness doesn't actually give you forgiveness. You can tell yourself you're forgiven. That doesn't make you forgiven. You can't just work harder to earn your forgiveness. It requires someone external to you, the person you have hurt or sinned against, saying, I forgive you. Right? That's how it works. Now, Christianity is very different. Christianity says, don't look within. It's not going to work. Don't look within for rescue. Don't look within for redemption. No, Christianity says your rescue, your salvation, your redemption, your acceptance, your forgiveness comes not from within, but from God coming to save you. Christianity is not about what you must do to save yourself. It's about what God does in Jesus to save you. What God does in Jesus to make you acceptable. What God does in Jesus to forgive you. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. He came and he died the death that should have been yours to make you acceptable. He came and he actually faced the judgment that should have been yours so that you might know forgiveness. And so in Christianity, God does everything. You do nothing. All you are asked to do is simply trust what he has done for you in Jesus. Now, Peter's rescue is actually a picture of God's sovereign grace. He does nothing. God, through an angel, comes to him in his helplessness, his powerlessness, his chains. God does everything to save Peter. And so Peter finds himself now a free man standing on the street. That's what you read in verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. You see that verse, verse 11? The God who has saved Peter from the clutches of sin is also the God who has saved Peter from Herod's clutches. So it's an amazing picture of God's grace, you know. God is not just bound by sin. No one is ever beyond God's salvation. But he is also certainly not bound by physical chains and prison cells. God is not constrained by hostile attempts to silence his people. God is not impotent and powerless to act for his people. God is not threatened by those who oppose his people. Now, as you go on in verse 12 to verse 15, you discover that the church that has agonized for him cannot believe what has happened. That's in verse 12 to verse 15. Uh, the church has gathered and they're praying. And then in verse 5, when Peter, who is in prison, comes knocking at the door, they, they're filled with disbelief, okay? which is sort of a, an irony, isn't it? Uh, have a look at verse 13 with me. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a sermon named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. She ex exclaimed and told the others, Peter is at the door. And they say, you're out of your mind. When she kept insisting, insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the door, they were astonished. And then Peter witnesses to God's divine rescue. Now, it's actually quite a comical scene. Here is God's people, they're agonizing, straining in prayer for Peter's rescue, for God's intervention. And Peter is at the, door, at the door, he's banging at the door, and God's people refuse to believe he's free. It's a comical scene. Here's a church praying fervently that God might answer their prayer. And when he does answer their prayer, they don't believe it. And so you read this passage and you sort of think, why pray for something when you don't think God can do it? What's the problem with this church? But maybe that's not a good question for us to ask because I suspect most of us actually do the opposite. I actually think we actually do the opposite. Most of us don't agonize in prayer in the face of hostility or persecution or opposition. You see, why do we not pray asking God to act? Why do we not pray asking God to deliver or rescue or change the circumstances? Well, maybe just maybe we're no different to the early church. They prayed, they prayed, but they didn't believe God would answer prayer. We don't pray because we don't believe God will answer prayer. See, we're no different. Now, come with me now to verse 18 to verse 19. It's a little excursus in your outline. Uh, they discover that Peter is missing and the guards are executed. 
Now, you might think that's pretty ruthless. Uh, the prison guards are executed. But this is how it worked out in the world of the New Testament, the Roman world. Uh, if you were a prison guard, your life was on the line if you lost the prisoner. That's simply how it worked. Which is why when we get to Acts chapter 16 with the Philippian jailer, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks, when there's the earthquake and the doors of the prison fly open, uh, you read that the Philippian jailer took out his sword to kill himself. Why? Because he thought all the prisoners are going to run and I'm going to get executed. And so he was going to take his life. But that's how it worked in the world of the New Testament. You were responsible for your prisoners. If they got lost, it was your life on the line. That's how it worked. So there's confusion. They don't know what's happened. Something impossible has taken place, and they are put, they're executed. Verse 20 to verse 23, we now come to the great reversal. We started with a king who raged against God's people. We had a church praying for rescue. We had a rescue in response to prayer. And now we have the king who threatened death on God's people struck down. Now notice how this passage ends. Not with Peter's execution, not with Peter's death, but King Herod's death. See the reversal? The persecutor who brought death on the church, who sought to bring death on God's people, the persecutor is humble and he meets his death. Uh, the persecutor who's more interested in the approval and praise of people is humble and brought down. And it comes in a very public setting as he arrogantly sets himself up in godlike fashion. He thought he was in control. Uh, he thought he had godlike power and authority. He thought he could silence God's people. He thought he could stop the good news of Jesus spreading, but God humbled him. Verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public speech to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Now, the historian Josephus writes of this scene, uh, that the crowds, seeing Herod dressed in silver robe, touched by the rays of the rising sun, addressed him as a god. They cried out, be gracious to us. That's where they look for grace. We have reverenced you as a human being, but henceforth we confess you to be more than mortal nature. And verse 23 is God's response to this king, this man who has acted like God, this man who, who has used violence not just to keep his power, but to persecute God's people, this man who wants to destroy God's church, this man who wants to silence the proclamation of the gospel, he struck down. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. Interesting, isn't it? In this same passage, the angel of the Lord struck Peter, and it was an act of grace. An angel of the Lord strikes Herod, and it's an act of judgment. Josephus, the historian, notes that Herod the king was seized with violent internal pains. They say that it was probably blockage of the intestines. He was carried home and he died five days later. But Luke tells us it was God who struck Herod down in judgment. And this is a real lesson for the early church and for us. The early church facing persecution, oppression, and hostility attempts to silence them from religious and political power. And the early church is reminded, it is foolish, futile to oppose Jesus. If you fight Jesus, you might win for a while, but you will ultimately lose. And nothing will stop the spread of the good news of Jesus. God's word will triumph. Notice with the contrast between verse 23 and verse 24. The tyrant dies, the arrogant persecutor dies, the political oppressor dies, but the word of God, the good news of Jesus, spreads and flourishes. What a tremendous ending. There is complete reversal. Immediately, verse 23, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. Verse 24, but the word of God, the gospel the good news of Jesus continued to spread and flourish. You know, at the start of the chapter, Herod is on the rampage, arresting, persecuting church leaders with death to silence the good news of Jesus. At the end of the chapter, Herod is struck down and dies, and the good news of Jesus goes out. The chapter opens with James dead, 
Peter in prison, and Herod triumphant. The chapter ends with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphant. You see that? What a reversal. It starts, James is dead, Peter in prison, Herod triumphant. It closes, Herod dead, Peter free, the word of God triumphant. And that should fill us with confidence. Let me draw three points of application. Here's number one. God's mission will not be stopped. The enemies of God and his people will not prevail. God's purpose and plan to see the good news of Jesus go out will triumph. Remember that wherever you are. When the missionaries came to Mongolia in 1870, there were four decades of missionaries who had come to bring the Jesus to Mongolia. This is in the 1870s for 40 years. The first, all the first missionaries were nailed to boards. They were thrown into wells and then they forced march to their deaths across the Gobi Desert. After 40 years of mission, there was no church in Mongolia. And then in 1921, Mongolia did the unthinkable. They were the only country in the world that invited the Soviets in to introduce communism to their country. Mongolia in 1921 became a communist country. All the Christian workers were expelled. A purge followed. Every trace of Christianity as well as every other religion was wiped out. More than one million uh, Buddhist priests were slaughtered. Religion was dead in Mongolia for the next 70 years. And Mongolia was closed to the, the Western world, the outside world, for 70 years. And then in 1990, Mongolia gained its independence from Russia after decades of communist rule shut to the outside world. At that time, there were only five known Christians in all of Mongolia. Three were missionaries. One was the missionary's interpreter and the other was a driver. And the missionaries didn't even go. They went in as tourists, by the way. That's how they went in. There were only two who were actually locals. Today, there are 600 churches and 100,000 believers scattered throughout Mongolia. 5% of the population profess faith in the Lord Jesus. And that's over the last 30 years in a place closed and hostile to the gospel. God's mission will not be stopped, you see. That's not just one story, many other stories. The enemies of God and His people will not prevail. God's purpose and plan to see the good news of Jesus saving will go out, even in the face of hostility, it will triumph. You must remember that in every generation, wherever God puts you. And so let me encourage you, be bold, be encouraged, be courageous enough to make Jesus known where God has placed you. Firstly, let me suggest a few things. The first thing you can do is make it known that you're a follower of Jesus. Start letting people know you're a Christian. That's what it means to start standing up for Jesus. Let people know you're a believer, you're a Christian, you do church on Sunday. Secondly, learn to start speaking of the Lord Jesus. Share what you've been doing on the weekend here at church. Share what God has been doing in your life. Right? That's what it means to witness. I've seen what God has done and I'm telling you. I've experienced what God has done for me this week and I'm telling you. You know, we have someone here in this church who's actually a lawyer. Uh, and once a week uh, in his team, everyone gets to share what's been happening in their week. And every week, you know what he uses that opportunity to do? He takes five, seven minutes to share what God has been doing in his life to his fellow lawyers. That's witness. That's bold witness. And he's been doing it now for a long time. Start a spiritual conversation in your workplace, your university. Start asking people whether they're spiritual. Who knows where the conversation will go? God's purpose is to make the saving work of Jesus known, and he will do it, and he can do it through you. Be bold, be courageous. The word of God will triumph. Two. Here's the second thing. Remember that God can deliver in the present if he so chooses. He has delivered at the cross. He has delivered you from the one thing, the one enemy that we should be afraid of, death itself. So he can deliver. He can save if he chooses. God is not powerless. Now notice in this passage, James dies by the sword, okay? So I don't want to downplay that. James dies by the sword. Peter is delivered. Does it mean God was powerless to act to save James? Of course not. Of course not. I mean, we read in Daniel 3, verse 16 to 18, that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said the same thing. They wouldn't wouldn't bow before the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, we will not bow, whether God delivers or whether God does not deliver, but we know he can. And so it's really, really important 
is that you understand that God can deliver if He wants to. This passage is not a name and claim passage. You know, some people believe passages you can name and claim, right? Name it, claim it, and suddenly it's yours. This passage doesn't work that way, right? It shows us that God can intervene. He's sovereign. He's powerful. He can bring His purposes to pass. And He brings His purposes to pass in two ways in the book of Acts. In the witness of those who suffer for their faith and in the witness of those who are delivered because of their faith. Because you have both in the book of Acts. God is actually furthering His word in the witness of those who die for their faith and in the witness of those who are delivered because of their faith. So pray we must always for deliverance in the face of hostility. Hope we must for rescue in the face of opposition. But trust we must in Him as well, whatever the outcome, because He can deliver. So remember that and pray. Thirdly, remember that there is a higher throne and we must look to that throne whenever we find ourselves under fire as followers of Jesus. Learn, and I mean this, learn to get down on your knees and agonize in prayer when you find the walls of hostility closing in wherever God has placed you. Teach your children, right? If you're a parent here, can I say to you, teach your children to agonize in prayer, to make prayer their instinctive response when their world is turned upside down. Teach your children to pray whenever they're afraid to be, uh, whenever they're afraid because they feel they're different as followers of Jesus. You see, speaking and standing up for Jesus is going to mean suffering and ridicule and loss and isolation for you and for your children. Learn to pray the Lord's Prayer daily for yourself, for your families, and for your kids. Look up each day to the one whose throne is above all power and authority, who rules and overrules every power and authority in the workplace, in the university, in the schools, where, in the playgrounds. Look up. Pray for strength to overcome the temptation to give up. Pray for strength to overcome the temptation to be afraid and to be a people pleaser. And pray for rescue. Pray for deliverance from evil that presses in. Let me pray for us. Father, this uh, Lord's Day, we want to pray your promises to Abraham in Genesis 12. Because we are your children. We are the sons and daughters of the of Abraham, by virtue of the promise, by virtue of the good news of Jesus. You have made us your sons and daughters. You've included us into your people. And so we pray, Father, your promise to Abraham. Bless those who bless us. Curse those who curse us. And help us today, Father, anchor in your triumphant gospel. We thank you that despite hostility, despite attempts to silence the Christian voice, even from political power and authority, wherever we find ourselves, we thank you that you have delivered at the cross, you can deliver where you are, and that your word, your good news, will triumph. It will prevail. It will never be stopped. So give us courage to look to you and to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, let me invite you to stand as we sing in response to God's Word. Above him, 
not before him all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. My God is the ancient of days. Do the dread. Do the dread of nights overwhelms my soul. He is here with me. I am not alone. Love is sure, and he knows my name. For my God is the ancient of days. None above him, none before him. All of time in his hands. His throne it shall remain and never stands. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in His name. For my God is the angels. the future brings. I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy comes standing face to face in the presence of the We 
stream below to the day Let us journey in the light Put on faith, on love As our armor fortified And the promise of salvation in our eyes On that day the proud before the faithful rise Strong Uh, invite you to take a seat uh, as we bring our time together to a close. Uh, let me remind you that our ACM will start at 11.15. Uh, some of you might want to go out and, and take a bit of a break. Uh, you may not even stay for the ACM uh, as we have visitors here this week. Um, as you leave, let me encourage you with God's word. Let me pray for us so that we might know God's blessing as we go out into His world as His people. Our Father and our God, we do want to pray and ask that the grace and strength of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit might be with us as we seek to go out into your world to live as your people. We want to ask that you might bless those who bless us, curse those who curse us. And we pray that you might anchor us in the confident knowledge that your purposes will prevail in and through us and that your gospel will always triumph. Strengthen us now as we leave, and encourage us, remind us, Father, as we remember your word, as we go out into your world this week, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Those of you who aren't staying and joining us for the ACM, we'll take a quick five-minute break, and our ACM will start uh, shortly at 11.15. The Zoom links will be up because our two other campuses will be joining us for the ACM. God bless you. We don't see you at lunch after the ACM. We'll see you next Sunday. Father, 
I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited.